I got tears rolling down my face, and I want to say it here, and I want to make this is just the only thing that has got me through the movement of what now, like 20 years, two decades, and hopefully many more to come. We don't win on a daily basis. In fact, we rack up a lot of losses and disappointments, and yet we are full of love and joy, specifically because of these relationships that we build. There can be nothing more rewarding than this, being able to see one another and hold one another up. And I thank you so much for holding me up and for allowing me to be a part of this. Thank you. All right. Um, what I would like to do with my time is to discuss the history of the present political moment in which we understand Palestine within an intersectional framework and as central to a progressive justice agenda. Admittedly, I do this primary for, primarily from my location in North America, so this does not adequately capture the global scope of our thinking. This history also includes a history of the black Palestinian solidarity movement, which based on all the conversations we've been having here, I will focus on for the sake of instruction. This is me, a little bit of me in professorial mode, so apologies <laughs> if you're sick of college. All right. The 1967 war, which indelibly transformed the Middle East political geography in the context of a rising global tide against imperial and colonial domination, proved to be a watershed moment for black Palestinian solidarity. The war and the diplomatic response to it created a new status quo in the Middle East that recast Israel as a colonial power in alignment with the United States Portugal, and apartheid South Africa. It also intensified the schism between Arab states that championed the Palestinian cause uh, as derivative of an Arab cause and organized militant Palestinian groups which sought to lead their own liberation movement. Within two years, Palestinian militant groups took the helm of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or the PLO, between its founding in 1964 in Egypt until 1968, it was not led by these Palestinian groups. When they took it over, they redefined the Palestinian struggle as a national liberation struggle. Under the leadership of Yasser Arafat, thank you. Oh, it's ice, I thought someone was clapping, okay. <laughs> okay, so where were we? So now the Palestinian militant organized groups take over the PLO in 1968. Yasser Arafat is the leader of it. They define it as a national liberation struggle and center armed resistance as a primary form of resistance, joining the global uprising against the hegemony of former and existing colonial powers led by the Third World Movement. The Palestinian struggle would become a principal part of its revolutionary agenda. The self-described third world sought to create an alternative historic and economic trajectory than the ones that the Cold War uh, offered based on non-nuclear proliferation and the end of colonial and neo-colonial rule. Newly independent states and ongoing national liberation movements constituted this project and spawned significant political institutions that waged fervent battles within the United Nations as well as through guerrilla warfare. By 1960, their efforts culminated in the UN Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples that finally and unequivocally condemned colonialism as an illegitimate form of governance. That didn't happen until 1960. In 1962, Algeria achieved national independence from 132 years of French settler colonialism, breathing new life into the Third World Project and especially into ongoing liberation movements waged in Angola, Mozambique, South Africa, and Namibia. Black internationalism as a political imaginary that tied racism with imperialism had developed well before 1967, but the war renewed and invigorated this framework. During the interwar years, the concept of national independence influenced leading black thinkers in the United States to describe their subjugation as a colonial condition and demanded sovereignty as a black nation as the requisite solution. The framework 
of liberation through national sovereignty made Zionism particularly appealing to black mainstream organizations. They viewed Israel's establishment as a triumphant model of liberation from Western hegemony and racism. Malcolm X, who broke away from black nationalism in favor of global human rights, represented a notable exception among mainstream black leaders who identified with Zionist ambitions. His appeal to pan-Islamism, together with his conception of an Afro-Asiatic race tying the peoples of the Middle East and black America, resuscitated and continued an international tradition. His shift away from nationalism also reflected a current in the black liberation movement that considered full inclusion in the US nation state, goals championed by the US civil rights movement, and insufficient resolution to the condition of unfreedom. Equality as full citizens may potentially alleviate black subjugation, but would fail to undermine an imperial system wherein the United States remained a dominant power. This radical current, which included James Baldwin and Harold Cruz and so many others, connected anti-black racism in the United States to systems of racial capital and saw global decolonization as a necessary element for black liberation. These politics aligned a black radical current with ongoing struggles for national liberation and more generally, a broader third world project. In this context, Israel's status as a new imperial power in the Middle East following the 1967 war, together with its proximity to the United States, its role in supporting apartheid South Africa, and its extractive practices of mineral resources from the African continent, propelled some black organizations to condemn Israel and openly embrace the Palestinian struggle. Most significantly, and the first to do this was the Student National Coordinating Committee, SNCC, they were the first to make this break in 1968 in a newsletter as they were led by Stokely Carmichael. The other most vocal uh, black organization to do this was the Black Panther Party, um, led by its chief theoretician, Huey P. Newton. The, uh, these politics, wait, did it, did it, okay. The PLO was often at the helm of a global anti-imperialist struggle with which the SNCC and the Black Panther Party identified. The PLO helped legislate new laws of war for irregular combat, other what people might otherwise call terrorism, but what national liberation organizations were doing. And they legitimized the use of force by guerrilla fighters, thus establishing the right to fight and helped the non-aligned movement mobilized the UN's various mechanisms on behalf of ongoing national liberation movements. In 1975, Fayez Sayer, a US-trained academic and founding director of the Palestine Research Center, which is the research center of the PLO and it's based in Beirut, led an effort to incorporate Zionism into the decade for action to combat racism and racial discrimination initiated to delegitimize de apartheid rule in South Africa. His efforts that he led, but didn't do alone, but it wasn't a PLO effort, culminated in UN General Assembly Resolution 3379, declaring Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination. The resolution formalized a racial theory of Zionist settler colonization within an anti-imperial framework and explicitly connected the Palestinian liberation struggle to ongoing struggles in the African continent. In this context, a vibrant Afro-Arab solidarity, the PLO, its various constituent parties, especially the PFLP, also demonstrably expressed Palestinians' joint struggles with black radical organizations in the United States by hosting, the uh, by hosting them in delegations to the Middle East, collaborating with them in international conferences, and publishing in their newsletters. And I should say that the AAUG in the United States and the OAS, the Organization of Arab Students in the United States, were part of that movement here in, in North America as well. This wasn't just transnational, but was creating a shift within the United States in the racial politics of Arab Americans. This revolutionary epic, 
began its steady decline in the early 1980s when the FBI's counterintelligence program, also known as the COINTELPRO, decimated the black radical movement through assassinations, politicized trials, mass incarcerations, and forced exile, and when Israel's invasion of Lebanon routed the PLO from its headquarters in Beirut in 1982. Globally, anti-colonial fervor waned as once revolutionary nationalist leaders transformed into autocrats that squashed social movements and political opponents in a bid to consolidate their rule. Perhaps the final blow to this era occurred in the early 1990s when Namibia became independent, when racial apartheid was dismantled in South Africa, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union singled, signaled the end of the Cold War. The question of Palestine, arguably the last vestige of the third world's anti-colonial agenda, was also resolved during this time. In 1993, the PLO, the PLO entered the Oslo peace process, wherein it formally recognized Israel, renounced armed resistance, and rescinded the 1975 UN resolution condemning Zionism uh, in exchange for autonomous regions without the promise of sovereignty. This marked a significant shift. Not only did the PLO rescind the resolution as a condition for entering into a peace agreement, the peace process framework shifted the global perception of the Palestinian struggle from one against settler colonial subjugation and reframed it as a conflict between two equal parties that required compromise by both sides to achieve a resolution. The shift was palpable. Uh, in grassroots efforts featuring a lot of dialogue groups, as well as in scholarly production and media coverage. The start of the second Intifada, which was not the second Palestinian Intifada, but it's how we know it, or the Al-Aqsa Intifada in September 2000, planted the seeds for yet another shift in our thinking. The first seven years of the peace uh, process had increased settlement growth by 100%, had introduced a new system of bypass roads and checkpoints, and demonstrated the permanence of the inter interim arrangements in the form of autonomy rather than independence. The collapse of the Camp David talks in 2000 precipitated the renewed uprising, which was much more militarized than its prede predecessor in the late 1980s. Israel responded to the Al-Aqsa Intifada with unprecedented military force unavailable to it under occupation law. To meet its needs, milita Israeli military lawyers created new law for fighting a war against terrorists and in effect a new means for maintaining its colonial dominance of Palestinians. It consecrated its new legal model upon Al-Qaeda's attack in September 2001. Israel's knowledge production, military and political industries, its Supreme Court immediately seized the opportunity to collapse its novel military approach within the U.S.'s war on terror. Together with the siege of Arafat, the peace process experiment was effectively over, notwithstanding the ongoing farcical attempts to hold it up on stilts. The end of the peace process, which unfortunately we're still hearing, is it the end, is it the end? It's been ended, right? Um, has in, since 2001, I'm arguing, has engendered two distinct trends. One is the framing of Palestine as a national security issue, and the other is an analytical return to Palestine as a justice issue. The return to a framework on the ground, excuse me, on the ground Israel's militarization of the conflict reached its apex when it placed Gaza under a naval blockade and land siege in 2006 and began, large, began launching large-scale military offensive against its besieged population in 2008. Israel literally transformed the tiny coastal enclave into what Samira Asmir has described as a colonial laboratory for asymmetric warfare, for weapons, for testing weapons and new methods of warfare that are exported everywhere in the world, well beyond Palestine, the United States, in Yemen, in Somalia, in the Philippines, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. Gaza is the laboratory for these methods and weapons of new warfare. 
The return to this framework collided with Israel's security approach in ways that resonated with a decades-long struggle that framed Palestinians as freedom fighters on the one hand and terrorists on the other. At the 2001 Durban Review Conference on Global Racism, a legacy, an ongoing legacy of the decade against racism inaugurated in 1975, Nadine Nebir, along with other collaborators, led a front of these efforts by authoring a paper excuse me, at the Durban Review Conference in 2001, the, the conference highlighted once again that Israel was an apartheid regime and once again introduced the concept that Zionism is racism. In this context, scholar, activist, Shiro, sister, comrade, colleague, Nadine Nevid, uh, uh, co-wrote an article called The Forgotten Ism, an Arab American woman's perspective on Zionism, racism, and sexism detailing the entwinements of feminism and the question of Palestine more generally. The paper never enjoyed the substantive engagement it deserved. The United States undermined the entire global anti-racist agenda to shield Israel from this critique and to avoid a discussion about its own accountability for reparations for its black communities. In 2005, the largest swath of the Palestinian Civil Society Organization launched the global call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions based on a rights-based framework inspired by the global divestment movement targeting South Africa. Knowledge production evidenced a return to this kind of anti-subjugation thinking and, and think, understanding Palestine as a settler colonial case study. Consider that whereas scholars published 78 articles concerning Palestine as a case of settler colonialism between 1990 and 1999, that number spikes to 952 scholarly articles published between 2001 and 2009 thanks to the efforts of scholar activists like Mezna Qato, Amar Jabari Salamanka, Karim Rabri, Nadir Shalhub Kavorki, and Sara Ahmoud, and Nahid Samur. The two trends, national security and justice frameworks, converged in the summer 2014, when Israel launched its largest and most brutal military offensive against Palestinians in Gaza, and when the Black Lives Matter movement congealed in mass protests in Ferguson, Missouri, in response to yet another state-sanctioned murder of a young, unarmed black boy, Michael Brown. Especially because of activism on the ground, a resurgence of black Palestinian solidarity commenced, and with it, a more acute understanding of Palestine as a case of settler colonialism and structural racialized violence. The systemic and untenable nature of Israel's wars on the Gaza Strip, together with the most right-wing Knesset vowing there will never be a Palestinian state, made ever more clear the fallacy of the peace process. The result? was the steady ascendance of understanding Palestine once again as a freedom struggle and as a justice movement. The resurgence of black Palestinian solidarity featured delegations, knowledge production, cultural work, joint protests that culminated in the summer 2016 when the BLM movement endorsed BDS as part of its 36,000 word platform. Significantly, out of the 36,000 words, words highlighting what was necessary for black liberation, the only thing that got attention was the BLM's endorsement of the BDS and its description of what was happening in Palestine as genocide. And several Zionist establishment institutions decried them, described the BLM and the platform as anti-Semitism, indicating again this trend of wanting to shut down progressive agendas by tackling Palestine. They were ready to take down this entire movement because of its choice to stand with Palestinian freedom. In response to the backlash, the BLM affirmed its unequivocal solidarity with Palestinians. And it should be said, it should be said that they affirmed that at great cost they have lost a lot of fundings and a lot of institutional funders and yet have not wavered on this question. Our work comes with risk and we thank everybody that is taking that risk. And because of their endorsement, we have won significant cultural boycott victories like Lauren Hill canceling, canceling her concert in Tel Aviv, like defensive lineman Michael Bennett not traveling on a junket to Israel. Specifically, and I will tell you that part, a critical part of why they pulled out of the concert and that junket was because the BLM told them that black liberation was entwined with Palestinian liberation. This brings us to the present, 
where, marked by the ascendance of Donald J. Trump, <laughs> the Trump administration has waged a bare-faced frontal assault against indigenous, black, Muslim, Latino communities. It has fomented hostility against Iran, rolled back a commitment to climate change, and emboldened white supremacist movements in the United States. Trump, for better or for worse, has further entrenched the question of Palestine into a progressive left movement driven by an intersectional analysis. This trend is best exemplified by the case of our dear sister freedom fighter, Rasmiya Odeh. who I had the recent pleasure of being with in Amman, who is shining everywhere she goes, who teaches us what, what, what survival and thriving looks like. So if we all just collectively send our energies to Rasmiya. Rasmiya is a freedom fighter, a former political prisoner. She is a torture survivor, including sexual torture. She spent two decades in the United States empowering Arab, Arab immigrant women in the Chicago area to develop themselves as agents of change. She is also accused of planting a bomb in a Jerusalem market that killed two Israeli students in 1968. She was among the signatories endorsing the woman's strike on March 8, 2017, including Dr. Angela Davis. In response to her endorsement and the Women's March embrace of her, liberal and right-wing publications began an onslaught against her as a convicted terrorist and an illegal immigrant. These realities generated a remarkable controversy about Ode and Palestine in particular, but more generally um, about feminism and whether we should understand feminism as a single issue matter concerning womanhood. The New York Times ran an op-ed by a woman expressing her feminist anxiety. She wrote, quote, I just wanna make sure y'all know this was a quote, not me, okay. <laughs> Increasingly, I worry that my support for Israel will bar me from the feminist movement that in aiming to be inclusive has come to insist that feminism is connected to a wide variety of political causes. <laughs> Hello, Kambahi River statement, but okay. This insistence can alienate feminists like myself who don't support all the other causes that they believe should be a part of feminism. For example, some who identify as feminists may not agree with the organizers of the international women's strike when they call for a $15 minimum wage. Nor do all feminists necessarily join the strike organizers in supporting the Dakota Access Pipeline protesters. End quote. <laughs> the New York Times would never, ever publish an op-ed decrying feminism for its embrace of a $15 minimum wage or its solidarity with communities that were fighting against the Dakota Access Pipeline. But it was okay to publish this article decrying its embrace of the Palestinian freedom struggle. <clears throat> but in this political moment, there was little tolerance for the disaggregation of a progressive platform. The attacks on Rasmiya and the attacks on Palestine were read as white liberal feminist attacks on an entire movement. No one relented, creating an ideological schism that suggested that the days for peps, progressives except for Palestine, were almost over. We're not there yet, but it's almost over. <laughs> this is a continuing trend in the United States, and barring unknown circumstances, is likely to become more pronounced. Support for Israel will increasingly become part of a conservative platform, and less and less of a bipartisan issue. Polls already indicate as much. According to a 2016 Pew Research poll, the share of liberal Democrats who sympathize with Palestinians has doubled since 2014. For the first time, more liberal Democrats are sympathetic to Palestinians than they are to Israel. And support for Israel is the least among millennials demonstrating a telling generational gap. That's what you all do. So thank you for all that work and your labor and your struggle and what you do. These are positive trends. They also come with tremendous responsibility and urge us to rethink the horizon of Palestinian liberation as well. For example, so I'm gonna end. This is, yeah, this is great. We're doing a wonderful job. Congratulations, yes, applause. But this comes with a lot of responsibility. This comes with responsibility to rethink what does this analytical return mean for us, 
our obligations and our solidarity the way we think about our own struggles. For example, how might the application of an anti-black framework, anti-black racist framework, unsettle a stark native settler binary between Jews and Palestinians? How has white supremacy in Israel racialized Middle Eastern Jews, for example, and forced them to deny their Arabness to pass? thus participating in what scholar Ella Shohat has described as an exercise in self-devastation. How does that inquiry reshape conditions, uh, coalitions committed to emancipation? If indeed we understand Palestine not just as anti-colonial, but also as anti-racist, what does that mean for how we understand Israel's horrific and dehumanizing treatment of Af African refugees seeking asylum? That it threatens with deportation back to assured death. Or what other responsibilities does a pro-Palestine movement have in the United States to the BLM movement, to resisting ongoing settler colonialism here in North America? How are we actively, I'm almost done, so I'm sorry. <laughs> How are we actively and unknowingly reproducing structures of domination in the United States even as we seek to resist them in the Middle East? These are provocative questions, deliberately meant to be provocative so that we keep thinking, but they also demonstrate that intersec intersectionality as a framework has tremendous potential and comes with tremendous responsibility as well. As Dr. Davis reminds us, the one and only Dr. Angela Davis reminds us, freedom is a constant struggle, and in it, we can find the liberation that we are fighting so hard to realize. Thank you so much. Thank you.